Um, start recording. Cool. We are recording. Um, Adam, tell people who you are. Tell people a little bit about yourself, what you do. Obviously, Rebel, why, the whole, give them the whole bit, and then we'll go from there. Cool. Hi, Adam. Uh, I am also Adam Miller. I <laughs> am the founder and owner of Rebel Bikes and Y Cycles. We're based out in Carbondale, Colorado, and we make uh, titanium adventure gravel bikes under the Y Cycles brand name and carbon fiber full suspension mountain bikes and very recently carbon gravel bikes under the Rebel Bikes name. Um, maybe obvious question right off the bat. Any interest in doing aluminum price point bikes uh, sooner than later? I'd say we have interest in doing just about everything related to bikes that we ourselves want to ride. And mm. I want to ride just about all the bikes out there. Uh, one thing at a time where a couple of years ago, we were six people in a warehouse here when we launched the Rebel brand in 2019. Now yep. we're 26 people, so we're growing quite a bit. But in the big scheme of things, we're still a very small company. So one step at a time, but I like making bikes. Yeah, and the bikes are amazing for people that aren't familiar. Like I have one, Adam X has one, I'm trying to get Ethan on one. Like the whole crew is uh, is on these things. They're they're rad. It's a ton of fun. They're like they're burly, all purpose, do whatever you want bikes. And for me, it's like I, I ride a rascal. Adam X rides a rascal. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for the area that we're at. But you guys have a new bike launching. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what that is and who that's kind of geared for. Yeah, well, and I'm stoked you guys ride the Rascal. I'm super stoked for you to try this new bike out that we've been working on for actually a really long time, I realized this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we we started working on this bike actually about six months before we launched the whole Rebel brand. So it's been about three and a half years in the, in the works. Um, okay. It is called the Rail 2.9. It's a long travel 29er. Uh, it's kind of the bike that since we launched, we all wanted. And also everybody asked us incessantly when we would have that bike. And we kind of knew we were working on it. But for three and a half years, kind of had to keep our mouth shut and say, oh, yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> we'll have yeah, one of those. Right. That day is coming up here. And and I think uh, on, on Wednesday, we're going to announce it publicly. So super amazing. Um, what... Who is that bike geared towards? What are we talking suspension wise? Um, who has been asking for that kind of thing? Because I think everybody has ev all the major mountain bike brands have a long travel 29er, but it seems like it's a difficult thing for people to dial in and make ride well. So I guess it's a multifaceted question here, but it's who is it geared towards? How did you guys do it well? And yeah, I mean, what's what's the actual spec on it? Cool. I'll, I'll try to keep track of that question as best I can. I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll forget something. Uh, so, so the, the special thing, one of the special things we do with Rebel Bikes is our suspension system. So we are the only company making carbon bikes that use the uh, Canfield Balance Formula patented suspension system, so CBF for short. So Chris Canfield and I go way back, fantastic guy. He invented the suspension platform that I believe is just truly hands down the best suspension system for a mountain bike. I was kind of shopping around for a suspension platform, you know, looking at some of the other main ones out there in the marketplace to use to create this mountain bike brand that I had kind of been dreaming about for a long time. Um, but I didn't want to just kind of do the same thing other brands were doing. So someone told me to go ride a Canfield bike. This is back in like 2014 or 2015. And I, and I pedaled one and literally pedaled it like a hundred yards in the parking lot um, at a demo event in Boot Lake Canyon outside of Vegas. And I was like, holy shit, this is the best pedaling bike and it just feels awesome all around. This is the suspension system I want to, I want to use. So I went and talked to Chris Canfield and he was like, hell yeah, let's work together. Let's in. And we just kind of started working together immediately after that. Um, my idea was to take his amazing patented suspension system and design our own high end carbon, slightly more mainstream, uh, bikes sort of that we wanted using their system. So, um, what's really exciting about the rail two nine, this brand new bike is we've now made three other full suspension mountain bikes and like 10 other hardtails with our wide cycles brand. Um, so we have a lot more experience now, um, both on bike, uh, development, but also on the suspension side of things. So when we worked with Chris Canfield on this kind of what we wanted was to make a bike that, um, stood out in the like pedaling performance category, as well as all the really, you know, keeping all the really good things about that CBF suspension system. So it's, this is 155 millimeters of rear travel with the 160 front fork with the option to go for 170 fork. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a long travel enduro style bike. Um, mm -hmm. But where we live, it's super hilly out here in Colorado um, where most people ride mountain bikes, you end up going up, you spend more time pedaling uphill than, than you do, you know, flying downhill. So pedaling efficiency was really important. And 
this version of CBF on this bike is absolutely mind blowing when it comes to how quick it goes uphill. And then it keeps all the awesome characteristics with downhill braking performance, traction, all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems like it's always been a difficult category for people to kind of narrow in. Like, I mean, Santa Cruz does a good job at theirs pivot. I think did an okay job at theirs and like, but I still, to this day, like we have some in the shop that I'm like, this kind of rides like shit, like this long, like a uh, Niner WFO, for example, like, I think that bike pedals like absolute garbage, like it, it for that. And that's the big thing is right. That bike rides really well downhill, but when you have to pedal uphill, it, it's like almost worthless. Like I'd almost rather push it a lot of times. And I guess that's, that's gotta be one of the hard things to figure out in that category is like, how do you make it rideable and have that much travel? Yeah. And like, there's a lot of really good bikes out now. The last few years, a lot of brands have been making just awesome dial bikes, especially in this category. Uh, but that definitely was not the case, you know, even five years ago or more, most of the bikes were not very good. Like this For combination sure. of really big, heavy wheels, 29 er wheels instead of 27 five and, you know, heavy rotating resistance on the tires, um, geometry that wasn't quite dialed and then suspension kinematics like that formula was not figured out, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago it's gotten much closer and it's kind of the quintessential enduro bike, you know, uh, longer, long travel 29 is, is the bike that most, I mean, we get asked about it 10 times a day. Like we get DMs or emails. <laughs> hey, when are you coming out this bike? Like it's like everybody wants, cause you can get shreddy on it. You can do all day right. long rides in the, you know, above tree line. Um, but I can't stand bikes that don't pedal. Well, I come from a, a racer background. I kind of tried to be a pro mountain bike racer in my early years of college. And when I realized I wasn't really fast enough for that, I decided to get into the business side of, of the bike <laughs> industry instead. Um, but because of that, like, I don't have all that same natural talent a lot of the people I was racing against had. So I want to make a bike that really, you know, helps out. I like going fast and competitive. Yeah. It's fun to go uphill. It's fun to go downhill. So designing a bike with, you know, that in mind of let's, let's make sure this thing can pedal uphill. The downhill part's almost, almost easy. The CBF system is like, right. Sorry. It, it, it just that when you grab your brakes it doesn't affect the suspension system at all um so the downhill performance is just incredible uh mm -hmm. the leverage curve i think is dialed you can run a bunch of coil shocks on this bike downhill performance is like a no-brainer it rides so good but that uphill thing is what i'm I think is going to really set this bike apart from some other ones out there and is that what you want to see most people run as a as a shock is like running a coil shock on those bikes you know, not most people, I'd say it's totally, that's going to be like an aftermarket option. We'll have a push coil option in the future, um, yep. but it's specced with a RockShox or Fox AirShock. Uh, and then if you want to get a coil, you can, you know, people can do that on, on their own. On my personal bike, I'm going to run a coil because there's nothing like a push coil. I like the way it feels a lot. Personally, I'm spoiled now. Like I have that push 11.6 or whatever on my, uh, yeah. rack. it's like, dude, I'm never going to get anything else like it just feels so good it's it's bizarre because i really thought that it was hype until i got one. dude it's unfair i put a sample <laughs> on one of my bikes a couple of years ago and i was like oh shit i i need this on every single one of my bikes and i can't yeah. go back it's like a lot of things in the bike world even a lot of you know some of the products we sell and we, we really try to make a point to only sell stuff that we ride ourselves and that we think is good right. There's some things you can spend money on or upgrade on your bike where I'm like, you know what? Most people aren't going to notice a big difference. If you want to spend that extra money, good for you. Bikes are cool. New fancy stuff is really cool. But some things right. really like, let's be honest, you're not going to get a massive performance difference out of, but that push coil shock. I mean, holy shit. I think we do. It's, I think it's a $900 upgrade. Yeah. Um, don't quote me on that. It is worth every penny. Like that it's thing. Crazy. It's crazy. Right? So good. I'm telling you, like, and I, I'll tell you firsthand, like I, I, really was like am i really putting that like am i spending an extra 900 bucks or whatever i spent on it and i at first was like i wanted i went in wanting to not like it like i want yeah. i went in wanting to be upset that i spent the money on it and i left like i will never uh, this is what i'm i'm stuck here like i want it on everything i could not agree more i was skeptical of spending that much money on a coil and now when i go into my basement i have like the most <laughs> of bikes of all time and they each have a, a push coil on there <laughs> kind of yeah. tell myself that's why i decided to start a bike company because i can never afford to have that many bikes with perfect build kits on them and i was just shots. gonna ask you are you a uh, are you a hoarder are you a bike hoarder you know i i'm actually not um i go back and forth though i get really attached to certain bikes and just yesterday i was talking to some people here in the in the shop because we were talking about selling some like my old bikes you know as we to make room in our demo fleet for new ones right. a lot of my personal bikes are also demo bikes yeah, um, and 
it reminded me of a few years ago. It was back in 2018 before I launched Rebels. We were just selling the Y-Cycles products. It was myself and two or three employees at the time. And like any old business, we had one of those moments where we were running out of money, um, which I've had a few of those in the <laughs> several years ago. Uh, <laughs> and so I decided, well, it's time to sell some personal bikes. And I had a Y-Cycles R+, Plus, our titanium bike. Um, and I had it, had it built up since 2016. It was serial number 001. It was my favorite bike <laughs> and I sold it because we were running low on cash and business is growing and all that stuff. And I realized, you know what, I should probably be more of a hoarder and do whatever I can to hold on to those bikes. If I ever find that bike again, I'll pay someone like twice as much as what I sold it to. For it. I was just <laughs> going to ask that. Yeah. Like you have to, I have stuff like that, that I've sold off like 10 years ago or whatever that I was like, Pah! like, why did I do that? Yep. It's a uh, time and silly option, but you know, what are you, what are you going to do No, yeah, But I like, I, I, I have one of each of our bikes right now, which at this point is getting kind of obnoxious because between the two brands, we, we have like 10 models and that's, that's, that's a lot of bikes. I don't have enough room in my house for that many bikes. Yeah. You need a new house for the new bike. Like it's just at that point, that's when you know you have a problem, I guess. For, um, for problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good problem to have, I guess, if you have that ability to have that many bikes and that's, uh, that's amazing and good for you. And honestly, there's people that don't own bike companies that have that many bikes. So, right. That's uh, it is what it is. Um, can I ask you about the gravel bike? Because we, I mean, since the last time we talked, you guys have launched a carbon gravel bike. What's the story there? Why did you feel like you guys needed one? Hold yeah, it. gravel bikes are freaking fun. Like, it's true. It's not. they're kind of a popular item right now in the bike world. There's all sorts of new gravel events coming up. Um, we built a gravel bike for Y cycles back in 2016. It actually got on the cover of like road bike action magazine in 2017. It was the biggest publicity I'd had uh, for that brand. It, it was, a it is a really dialed bike. We're now in version four of that, the R plus V4. So it's a titanium gravel bike uh, with rack mounts and extra bottle mounts. Um, it's got really dialed geometry. We did some pretty neat things with the geo back in 2016 okay. um, in terms of Kind of like almost applying like modern mountain bike geo to gravel bikes but we didn't really talk it up that much because we were a super small brand so it had kind of slacker uh head angle longer reach uh there's way less toe overlap on that bike which is an issue with some other gravel bikes that kind of keep road geometry the wheelbase is super narrow so when right. you turn the handlebars your toes can hit the tire um and also with that more road bike geometry the bikes are a lot less capable on single track and the crazy thing about these gravel bikes is you can rip them on a lot of single track trails um so they're just like a super fun bike all around so with the y cycles product we kind of decided to get a little more modern back in 2016 when we were developing it and people freaking loved it um and so it's kind of always in the back of our minds that we'd make a carbon one too just because there's a time and a place for a titanium gravel bike and there's a time and a place for a carbon gravel bike and that's kind of the one product i could say that different material each is awesome in its own very different way like right, titanium right. is super comfortable and super durable uh it's gonna last forever if you put a bunch of bags and gear and stuff on that bike you know you don't have to worry about scuffing it up uh you can crash it in a rock garden and it's titanium so who cares if you get a little dent in it so titanium is really cool but at the end of the day it's significantly heavier than carbon um you can't do as much with lateral stiffness um, as you can with carbon um, or with vertical compliance although our tie bike's really quite comfortable vertically uh, but carbon has this really like damped, quiet ride feel to it if you do it right. And then at the same time, you can shape the tubes and use different types of carbon to make it crazy stiff laterally. So when you're sprinting or, you know, across the finish line or, or railing around a corner and nice stiff frame, it, it's just pretty cool. So titanium better for like adventure, longer distance type gravel riding. Carbon generally better for, you know, snappier, faster, maybe race oriented sort of stuff. There's some overlap you know, depending on the person and the riding style and where you are, but there's some pretty neat benefits to both. So I think it was a year and a half ago, we said, you know what, we've been wanting to make this carbon bike in the back of our minds for like three years now, let's just go do it. And we did. Um, <laughs> and that bike is sweet. We basically use everything we learned from the geometry and our titanium gravel bike and apply it to this carbon bike, um, which does make it stand out a bit from some other bikes. I'd like to say it's not like this crazy, you know, gravel bike just for mountain bikers with like a 62 degree head angle or, you know, uh, right. but it's also not like a crazy, you know, cyclocross or, you know, one hour gravel race only bike. It kind of fits a nice 
spot right in the middle of that, which I think is going to apply to a wide range of, 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 of riders. And, and the geometry is just freaking dialed on that thing. It, it's super comfortable. It's super fast. It feels great. Can you kind of explain the difference? Because I think this is a common question that people have and don't really understand and, and, and people don't give often enough a good answer to it. Can you explain to people what the difference is between a cross bike and a gravel bike? Like what, like, <laughs> because I don't, I, I really, I get this, this question asked all the time. And every time I'm like, okay, like there's a few good reasons. And then to the, to most customers, they're like, I don't get it, you know? So maybe you can give a better explanation than I can. So, you know, every day I feel so ridiculously lucky to have the job that I have and to work with people that I do. <laughs> I get to make bikes for a living. I get to come into work with 26 other like freaking bike nuts and everybody here loves bikes. And we live in a small town in Colorado where we can like ride bikes across the street and go fishing in a blue ribbon trout stream, like 200 yards away. We have a company raft, like, Oh my God, I feel so lucky that I get to make bikes and somehow it's working out to be like a semi-legitimate sort of career. I still wear flip-flops to work most days, but like, really cool bike industry is such a great place you get to travel all over the world to go to these trade shows and events and meet other like bike bike nuts like myself and um the bike industry is amazing but sometimes the bike industry does <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I this is coming. like this like where they come up with something called a gravel bike that's really not very much different than a cyclocross bike and everybody is confused even myself and i like to think i've been like really involved in the cyclocross and gravel scene for, for a long time. Like I did all these like USGPs and race collegiate nationals for cyclocross. Like yeah, um, cyclocross is great. I know a lot about this and I don't think I have a very good answer for what the actual agreed upon difference is between a gravel bike and a cyclocross bike. There's certainly, you know, every bike we design is for a purpose. So if you think about someone who's going to go do a 45 minute race plus two laps through a muddy field, and you know sh shoulder their bike toss on their shoulder run up and down a hill you're going to design a, a bike that looks kind of like a road bike with bigger tires and it's going to be designed a little bit differently and then if you think about somebody who's going to go do you know like unbound gravel or one of these 200 mile gravel bike races you're going to design a bike a bit differently besides that there's not very many tangible differences that i've figured out between a gravel bike and a cyclocross bike but i think you decide what are you going to use the bike for and you go to a bike company that's made a bike for that reason and i bet you're going to be really happy with it yeah yeah and i think that's good i've like i try to like simplify it for people and i'm like okay like tire clearance that's that's the big like that's the difference and like it's yeah. it's true sometimes it's not true other times like it's just like it's one of those areas where i feel like cyclocross was kind of ahead of its time almost and gravel bikes just didn't come people didn't understand what they were and i initially was kind of a hater like when gravel bikes came out like a few years ago when they were pushing it, I'm like, why do I need this? Like I have a road bike and like if stuff is sketchy, I still ride my road bike. If it's like that sketchy, I ride my mountain bike. What do I need a gravel bike for? And I think there's a lot of people still kind of like hanging out in that camp. But once you ride a gravel bike like in Vermont or in Colorado and like you hit these dirt roads for hours and hours and hours and you're like, this this is why I have a gravel bike, right? And honestly, all last summer, all I did was ride, I rode my gravel bike way more than I rode my mountain bike because, like, you get a beefy enough tire on that thing, that is your mountain bike. <laughs> like, it yeah. basically is an all-purpose bike. And, and then at the same time, they're super they're super capable. They're way lighter and faster, so you can cover way more ground. I mean, I haven't totally. ridden gravel bikes in Vermont, but I think it's pretty similar to here where there's just dirt roads yeah. everywhere. And as soon as you have a bike made for that, you end up taking advantage of that. And it's a way to explore these places you would never go otherwise. I, I was in the same boat where I was kind of a hater. I was like, I have the second cross bike. Right. Why are there bikes called gravel bikes that, okay, they can fit a tire that's, you know, a couple millimeters wider. Like, what's the difference? Um, and, and there is a difference. The geometry is different. Uh, the tire clearance, if you get the right bike, is certainly different. Um, but I think there's a lot of blending between the two. And that's something we try to do with our bike is not say this is a bike made just for this and if you want to go race a cyclocross bike or a cyclocross race you better get another bike um yeah. like we made like an ovalized flattened shape on the bottom of the top tube on our bike so that you can toss it on your shoulder with some more comfort right. you're gonna go do a gravel bike race we also made it have clearance i think it has the best clearance of any bike out of any similar style gravel bike out there you can fit over 50c tires with a ton of room for mud or you can do 27.5 by 2.2 uh, so, it, and at the same time, you can fit a really big 48 or 50 tooth chain ring on there. So it, I, I like to think our gravel bike is extremely versatile in the sense that you can build it up. If you want to do some cross races, great. If you're a world cup cyclocross racer, you should probably get a little more specific cross, cross bike. 
if you're someone like me who's going to do one or two cross races a summer just kind of for fun this bike's going to hold its own it's going to be awesome it's going to feel great if you want to put you know two inch tires on there so you know put a bunch of gear on there so you can ride for two weeks without stopping the bike's going to work fine for you too so I, we kind of designed it with a lot of that in mind of like what is the difference between all these different styles of bikes and trying to make yeah. a bike that with some modification if people want to modify it from the stock spec it's going to be able to do quite a bit more than yeah and i will say like personally like gravel bikes for me have been like and you can have anybody listening from my shop right now will attest to this it's like i change out my gravel setup more than probably anybody ever like because you can't like there's sometimes i'm running that like what's the name of that company that that redshift stem i'll run that sometimes like the bouncy stem you seen those oh yeah yeah they're ridiculous like so <laughs> they're they're like these little suspension stems and sometimes i'll run that and then sometimes i'll run completely rigid and i'll like you know, run a slightly longer stem setup and I'll run, you know, a 29 by two tire or I'll run, a, you know, 700 by 28. Like it's, it's just, you it's can set up whatever you want. And that's, what's great about it. Yeah. Yeah. And especially it kind of makes designing like, group sets, right? Yeah. You can just like, it helps you like get out and try different types of riding and maybe you build your gravel bike up to ride a bunch of smooth single track, or maybe you build it up to go do like a, you know, road ride with some gravel. Like it just, it's half the fun is kind of tinkering with the, bikes you own and seeing seeing what that does you know and and, and what you can see out and out in the mountains when you when you pedal further out for sure um okay enough bike specific talk i kind of want to talk about like growing pains for you guys i kind of want to talk about like the bike industry as a whole like last year was a shit show um we know this everybody that went in and tried to buy a bike uh from any company uh found this out um what what was that like for you guys talk to me about where that put you guys like in terms of like a position as a brand um like because we talked in i don't know uh september or whatever and you were like yeah we're sold out of bikes like we don't have bikes like <laughs> i can try to get you a bike but like there's no bikes basically so what is what is that feeling like what do you do in that situation as a company well, I'm proud to say that since we talked back then, we got both you and Adam X on on some rascals. So yes. we are we are getting bikes <laughs> out the door, but significantly slower than expected. Uh, we are learning so much every day. You know, some days I feel like ah, oh, it's all over and everything's great, and you know, life's gonna get back to normal. And other days, I think, oh my god, we thought it was terrible, and now it's just gonna yeah. get worse. Uh, so it sure keeps things exciting around here. I, I feel some days, actually, very often over the last you know year. Um, I feel more like we own a logistics company instead of a, a, a bicycle company. <laughs> sure. uh, I didn't quite expect to learn as much as I have about global shipping and supply chain challenges, but it's been pretty neat. So uh, yeah, without saying the same thing everybody else has said, I mean, everything in the world is hard to get right now and everything's unpredictable and prices are going up and shipping's taking longer. And, you know, that's just kind of the new, the new normal that we're dealing with. For us, I feel just extremely lucky that we've launched our brand when we did. Uh, when we launched back in March of 2019. So actually we're celebrating our third birthday here in a week at the Sedona Bike Fest. Hey. So we're going to have a cake. If you're in Sedona, come to the Sundowner <laughs> Bar. It's, it's the best dive bar in the country, I might say. And so we'll have a third birthday celebration there. Um, <laughs> we basically, we had a, a whole year before the pandemic hit to kind of get our name out there, get bikes out the door. And back then we were dealing with you know, we could order more suspension forks or tires or wheels and get them here in about 30 to 45 days. Today, we can order more brakes or wheels and get them here in anywhere between 500 and 800 days. And so all of a sudden for our like, you know, young company that at the time in 2019, we had seven people, then I think we had like 12 people in 2020 and now we have like 26. Like we, we have been forced to grow up by like 10 years in this, you know, short period of time. Right. We got a fancy new software system that when I first saw the price tag, I was like, oh my God, I can buy like a really nice car for that price. You know, and I thought, why would we spend so much money just on this like ERP inventory system? It turns out it's the best thing we ever did. Like, like we invested in all this technology. We hired several more people who are way smarter than I am when it comes to like production planning and inventory planning. Mm -hmm. And so the, the crew we have here now, um, we have three people whose full-time job it is just to figure out how to buy stuff and ship things and plan for that and communicate that to the rest of the company. They have done such an incredibly good job with going from the small startup company of a few people 
to dealing with like, this global pandemic where lead times went from 30 days to, to 300 days to 600 days or more. And yet we're still shipping. Um, I mean, we're shipping a lot of bikes out. We're shipping far more than I ever expected we would be shipping. Um, it's not enough. Our demand is still higher. Uh, we still have people upset and waiting on bikes. Uh, but our capacity is about triple what it was last year. And we're FedEx truck gets full every day at three o'clock. And I'm pretty happy with that at least. Yeah. Yeah. That, and honestly, like that's, that's good to hear. I mean, that's good news. I think across the board, you're starting to see stuff show up more. Um, inventory start to come back. I guess my next question is kind of like a gloom and doom question. And that is like, do you think there's a bubble that is going to burst in terms of mountain biking? Right. Because so many people got into mountain biking. So many people bought new bikes. So many people decided that this was the sport for them during the pandemic coming out of it. And now that we're starting to see product kind of catch up and become more available, is there a worry for you that there is going to be like a shutoff valve? So I look at this stuff and I think about this stuff way too much and stay awake at night thinking about these sorts of questions. Uh, and there's all sorts of data and industry reports and, you know, tariff data and here's the numbers of all this yeah. stuff that's happening. Um, and there's, there's people way smarter than I am when it comes to analyzing data that have their predictions on everything. But I usually go with kind of trusting my gut. And if I put myself in the shoes of, of, of a lot of people who, you know, get on a bike for the first time, it's, pretty damn addicting. I mean, all of us are in this industry because we started riding bikes and thought, wow, this is more fun than any other sport. Uh, and I think the best thing about the pandemic with all the terrible things that happened is it did force a lot of people to get outside. Um, it inspired more people to go do outdoors things. Uh, luckily, a whole lot of those people went and bought bicycles. A lot of them were at the lower end of the market. Some were at the higher end of the market. But my thought is even if you know 10% or 20% of those people that spent money on a new bicycle decide to stick with the sport, they're probably going to get more into it because look at all of us like how many of us bought one bike and just have one no we keep on buying bikes we keep trying new things we build our travel and our vacations around riding those bikes in different places and decide to sign up for a race just to experience something new and i think if even a small portion of those new riders that got into the sport during covid decide to stick with it and get even half as hooked as all the rest of us did it's going to be the best thing that happened to the sport of mountain biking there's gonna be more and more people out there it will probably you know benefit companies you know like mine where we sell more of the high-end products um, maybe, you know, cheaper bikes, um, you know, maybe there will be a little bit more of a boom and bust. It's hard to say, but I, I would like to think people maybe bought themselves a bike for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks and they get really into it and decide to upgrade and buy a nicer bike and next year buy a nicer bike. I think we're going to see a lot more users out there on the trails and I'm really excited for more and more trail building to happen so we can keep on enjoying those trails. Yeah, for sure. No, I kind of feel similar. I'm, I'm a little uh pessimistic i think because i run a bike store and we have bikes in stock but it's like this time last year i had bikes in stock too you know and nobody bought bikes because it was winter and nobody was thinking by bike by bike by bike and you're sitting on all this inventory and you're like okay like what if this is uh what if we don't sell any of it you know but then you move all of it and you're like okay cool like everything's fine <laughs> so dude i I started working in a bike shop when I was 14. I'm 30 years old now. So I guess it's been 16 years of yeah. close to full time, you know, a little bit less during some school and stuff, but working in the bike industry and every single year, November and December and January sucked. And every single year from when I was 14 <laughs> until, until one month ago, I thought, Oh my God, this sucks. Like no one's going to buy bikes. It's winter time. No one's going to buy all these bikes we have in stock. And every single year, 15 times in a row now I've been surprised and people buy bikes again. It's just a time of year thing. It's winter. It's not bike season starting about now, March, April, May, things, things pick up. So I think people are going to yeah. skis away pretty soon and get right back into biking. Um, last question for you. What, what do you guys have for target goals for this year? Like, what do you have in your head? Is there something that you're looking to achieve in 2022 as a bike brand um, and it's not necessarily even numbers wise, like I'm not even really asking how many frames are you planning on selling? I'm more asking like, is there, is there something you have like up on a wall somewhere that you're like, okay, this is our goal for this year. I like that question. I, I mean, the real simple answer and as cliche as it sounds is we want to be the best bike brand out there. I truly believe we can do it. I think we have the product. I think we have the suspension system. I know we have the best team of people. I mean, we, the, the 26 people that work here in Carbondale every day are absolutely incredible. It's the most diehard, passionate group of people I've ever worked with. And I feel so lucky about that. 
I want to be the best mountain bike brand and I want to do it in a whole lot less time than some other brands out there. That doesn't mean I want to be the biggest. I don't want to be this massive, crazy, huge company. Um, I want to, you know, have our company wrapped up and get to go fishing on after work whenever we feel like it. But I want to be the best. So that means getting customers super excited, taking care of people, you know, being as honest as we can about delivery dates. Uh, it's going to take us some time to be the best, but I, I want to just keep making progress and chipping away at that and, and get people really psyched on, on, on the bikes that we make. Is, is there a brand that you look at and you're like, okay, those guys are in a position that we would like to be in? There's two brands I really, re well, I respect all bike brands. It's hard to make a full suspension not bike. And there's some really. It's hard to be a bike brand, brand period. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It takes a lot of work and there's some great bikes out there. Um, there's two brands that stand out. Ibis. I really like those guys have always been super nice. When I first launched Revel, I got a text from Scott Nickel that day saying congrats. And I thought that was just such That's a cool. class act. Uh, they're just a really good, nice company. Their bikes are phenomenal. Everything they do is great. What they're doing here with making stuff in the U.S. is really neat too. Um, but also, when I look at Santa Cruz bikes, I really would would you know love to be similar to them on any level at some point. They've done a great job. Their product lineup is incredible. They make bikes for all types of mountain biking, and they do a really good job um, at at all of those bikes. So uh, yeah. I've got beef with them right now. I've got like eight hundred. They've like raised prices like eight hundred bucks. Like they're oh, like wow. their bikes are all the like they're all so tight and, and don't get me wrong. Like they're I think they're the shit too. Like they're obviously <laughs> they're doing a great job. It was just funny like when I got like a blanket email and it was like oh yeah all the bikes are going up like eight hundred dollars this year. So like that bike that cost you twenty five hundred last year is now thirty three. And I'm like wow, like that's a lot, man. It's brutal. We, we actually, we've done two price increases and they were tough. Like it was one of the, you know, the more emotional conversations we've had in the, here in the building. Cause obviously yeah. we're a business and we need to make money, but at the end of the day, like we're more to ride bikes than, than anything. Well, and it, it's tough to raise prices and sometimes you have to. And, and it's not, can easy. you explain like from the, from the brand side, because, and I get it, but explain from the brand side a little bit, just real quick quick like why it had to happen um for brands across the board because everybody saw bikes go up in price and like ev everybody that comes into a bike shop is like oh it's because everybody wants to buy bikes you guys are just like raising the it's like we're not raising the prices it's like it cost me two hundred dollars to ship a bike to adam x the other day in new york one like two states over you know so it, it's crazy like shipping costs are expensive every everything has gotten more expensive right so that has to come out of somewhere so uh, that's that's what how i look at it Mm -hmm. how would you explain it to someone i would say at least for our company it has nothing to do with demand we probably could have raised prices more and we probably still could and and, and we're not going to because i like to sleep well at night and be really yeah. proud of what we're doing um, and i know we waited quite a bit longer than we should have for our first price increase but what we saw is i mean there was a period of a month or two in there about a year ago where we got emails probably once a week from all of our vendors, whether it's our frame manufacturers or, you know, SRAM, Shimano, Fox, RockShox, whatever, with these really nice letters, you know, really well-written letters apologizing, but letters saying, hey, our raw material for this one up, our shipping for this one up, you know, our cost on these items has gone up by X amount. Therefore, we need to raise your price by 5% or 8% or 13% or 17%. Um, right. And all those emails, you know, we had purchase orders in our, in our system for a long time. So we're trying to plan ahead to buy, you know, say a hundred bike seats. And then we got an email saying, Hey, starting next week, everything we ship you is now 17% more expensive. We just ate it. I mean, for months, we just ate that difference. And at the end of the day, we still have to make enough money to see everybody. And we offer healthcare to all of our employees and we want to keep doing better and better at, at, at all of that. And so what we did was we decided, okay, we have to do a price increase. So we read all the numbers and we said, it's, we did like an average five and a half percent price increase um, at retail across all of our products. But what we said is we sent that email and said, if you have a bike on order with us, your price doesn't change, but starting in, you know, four months, your price will change. So we tried to say, Hey, we got surprised at all these price increases that were happening with like two days notice. We're yeah. going to try to let our dealers and our customers know we're increasing their price, but not for anything they've ordered already. And I think maybe that was too like hippy dippy, you know, friendly capitalism, but I'm still really happy we did it. I mean, we no, dude, that's fucking sick. I think that's, I think that's one of the best moves you guys could have made. Like, because that's full transparency. It's like, otherwise everybody would have been sour. Right. Yeah. And you know, they would have been right. And that's like, that's business. And some brands will do that, but that's like, that shows the kind of brand that you guys are building. 
Yeah, we, we want to get people stoked for the long term. I mean, I'd be pissed if I bought a bike for $6,000 and I got emails saying, actually, you're going to have to pay us $6,500. I'd say, you know, hell, hell no. <laughs> like, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, yeah. No, it's it's ridiculous. So, yeah. so um, it's, it's not fun to have to raise prices, but we tried to do it in the best way we possibly could. And, you know, if things get back to normal and prices come down, I'd love to lower the price of our bikes. I have no right. idea if that'll happen. Maybe that's like stupidly wishful thinking. But if our yeah. prices come down, we'll lower the price of our bikes if we... If if that's awesome. Comes. Um, Adam, where can people find the bikes? Where can people find you on social? Where can people find all the information that they need? Uh, rebelbikes.com at rebelbikes on Instagram, rebelbikes on Facebook. It's pretty, pretty easy there. Ycycles.com uh, at ycycles on Instagram. I'm adam.miller907 on Instagram. So hit me up, follow us on Instagram, all that good stuff. We got a lot of pretty cool products in the works. We have this Rail 29. We're we're launching now and we have a lot more cool stuff. So stay tuned. I think you'll be excited. And I know we didn't talk much about why, but like that, there's like, there's some rad shit there. Like I've got that DJ and like, that is the most ridiculous thing that I own is uh ridiculous. Is thing right <laughs> <laughs> um, but once again, thank you for the time, man. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Adam. Super good.